we're going to do a broad overview of empiricism and its approach to epistemology. We'll introduce John Locke in this part one of the video, and then there will be a second part getting into more details about John Locke's philosophy and his version of empiricism. Empiricism is the approach that says the best grounding for beliefs comes through basic empirical beliefs, beliefs that are formed from the senses, from our seeing and hearing and tasting and touching and feeling things, those provide the, the foundation for other beliefs. They, these are justified, the empirical beliefs that we have are justified, and then they are the source or the grounding for other beliefs. So inferential beliefs ultimately must be justified by basic empirical beliefs. So with Descartes, we saw at the point of his foundation, the idea that he exists for the empiricist, it would be our senses, what we experience in the world. So the point of the pyramid for the empiricist are the beliefs that come through the senses. There are a couple strengths of empiricism that we should mention. One, empirical beliefs are generally reliable. They are connected to the way the world is. So we can trust our eyes, basically, to get around in the world. We hear what other people are saying. We understand what the temperature is by the way it feels. Generally, our senses are very reliable, allow us to navigate the environment around us. Now, empiricism is also supported by the success of the sciences. In the sciences, our knowledge of the world is ultimately based on what we experience through our senses. Of course, we use tools and technology to extend our senses, but we always have to use our senses in order to make use of those tools. Now, if the type of the pyramid is beliefs formed by the senses, if that's the foundation, then what you're going to need to do for empiricism is say something about perception. So the empiricist needs to address this question, how does perception work? We're not talking about how eyes function and how ears function. We're not talking about physiology. We're talking about a theory of perception, a broad theory. As we go through the examples, hopefully we will get a better grasp on what we mean by those distinctions between doing physiology and doing a theory of perception. So there are a few major philosophical theories of perception. So one theory that we're going to investigate here is naive realism. Now naive is somewhat pejorative, but it's also very intuitive it's not meant to be re disrespectful, and there are people who hold to naive realism. A second view is the one of Locke called indirect realism. So we'll take a more careful consideration of that in, in our part two video on Locke. And then finally, we will look at idealism, a view that we're going to look at as developed by George Barclay. So first, Let's consider naive realism. The thesis is that the world is exactly as we perceive it to be. So if you perceive chocolate ice cream, if you see it, if you could smell it, if you taste it, then that means there's chocolate ice cream. Since we perceive the ice cream directly, it's just there, we perceive it directly, we know what's what exists. Now this is the most natural fit for empiricism. It fits with the strengths that we already discussed. Now, however, there are certain problems. One of them we've seen with Descartes, our perceptual beliefs are sometimes in air. We perceive mirages. We, we see a road and it looks like there's water in the road on a sunny day when there's not. We are mistaken sometimes in what we hear, what we perceive in other ways. And 
certain perceptual beliefs, and this is a considerable problem for naive realism, certain perceptual beliefs depend on the state of one's mind. So it depends on sometimes on what's going on in your mind, how you perceive color. We'll take a look at this in our part two video. Uh, the sense of touch, the sense of hot and cold, for example. When it's winter going into spring, uh, at least in the Midwest, say a 50 degree day that's sunny might feel really warm and nice. But when it's summer going into the fall, a 50 degree day with sun might feel cool. It's just what we've been used to in the transition and the difference. If you've been inside in the winter and it's really warm, you might go outside initially and think, oh, this is nice and cool. But then after a, a little bit, it's too cold. Sounds can change according to our position, our state of mind, like a train that's approaching us and the pitch gets higher as it comes near us, and then the Doppler effect, of course, it gets lower as it passes. The taste, for example, of orange juice, it's different if you drink it first thing in the morning or if you drink it after you've already brushed your teeth. The, the sense of smell, sometimes things smell differently according to our hormones or according to whether or not we have a, a, a cold, for example. So, our senses don't tell us exactly how the world is. So naive realism is problematic. Let's put this into an argument. The variance arguments are ways of showing problems with naive realism. And the idea is if the world were exactly as we perceive it, then no perceptions would be mind dependent the way we've just talked about. But of course, as we've just discussed, some perceptions are mind dependent. They depend on our state. And so we conclude that the world is not exactly as we perceive it, which means naive realism fails. So this is a, a problem with naive realism. It seems that there are some qualities that exist only in the mind, is what John Locke will say. And these he calls secondary qualities. The secondary qualities then are things like our perception of visual perception of color, our sensory perception of hot and cold, the pitch of sounds that we hear, uh, tastes and odors are secondary qualities. So as a result, what happens is we've turned toward indirect realism. And this is the view that we'll consider more carefully in part two. And the thesis of indirect realism is not all properties that we perceive an object to have are really in the object. Indirect realism says those things we've just been considering, colors, tastes, odors, pitches, sensations of hot and cold, those actually only exist in the mind. Think of the characteristics of the wax that Descartes held in his hand and how they all changed. So those existed only in the mind, the indirect realist says. Now, of course, even though uh, the world is not exactly as we perceive it, it certainly needs to be closely related to our perceptions for empiricism to work. And this is the view of John Locke. So as we note here with his dates that he lived, he was born during the time of Descartes. Uh, Locke is one of the most prominent empiricists that existed. He's one of the three great British empiricists of the modern era. He was uh, initiated empiricism, so to speak, and then at least for the modern era. And then after him came Berkeley, and then after that came Hume. Uh, a couple of the other great empiricists of the modern era. Now, proponents of indirect realism or indirect realism reject the idea of innate ideas. They reject Descartes' standard of certainty that he placed so much importance on. Instead, they say, we can basically trust our senses 
certainly not when it comes to these secondary qualities we've discussed, but definitely with things like shape and size and number of things that we're perceiving. Those give us a, an accurate view of the world. Now, recall the challenge from Descartes. Descartes was concerned about the problem of getting to, so to speak, the external world. If your own mind is that which is known best to you, what's going on in your mind, that's what we know best, and everything else can be doubted according to Descartes' methods, then you have to have a method how to get from your own mind the internal world, so to speak, to the external world, that which exists outside of our mind. So this is a challenge for empiricists. How does this happen? Let's transition to a, a different format here and consider this. So we start with a simple question. How does the content of our mind relate to the external world? So say, for example, this is an unfinished tree over on the right here. So let's make it nice and green and leafy. And say, for example, you are looking out at that tree. How does the tree provide our experience in our mind of that tree? We have an image that it is in our mind of the tree so that we could then close our eyes and, and maintain that image, so to speak. But how does that happen? This is a challenge. This is a question, especially for empiricists. So we have that challenge. How does the content of our mind, our, our perception of the tree in our mind, relate to the external world? In part two, we'll pursue how John Locke answers that question.